Right. Good morning, everybody. Um, sound check good? Someone checking sound. I hope sound is good. Send me a message if you're not hearing it. Uh, welcome to this fifth in our webinar series where I'm going to talk a little bit about current mode control. I hope in the meantime, you've all been enjoying our little cartoon series that we've done. We are in week 19 or week 20 of lockdown here in uh, California. No end in sight, unfortunately. Anyway, good chance to come and learn something and to teach and uh, have some fun today. Uh, there is a webinar handout. If you download current mode design uh, PDF, click on the handout section of the control panel for the webinar. You should be able to find that. And what we're going to talk about today is the seven secrets of current mode control. There's more than seven. They're not really secrets, but if you're just new to current mode control, you will have a difficult time finding these secrets written down in the literature in a way that's clearly clearly explained, I think. So let's begin with what we're going to do. Air, Denise. Secret number one. Current mode control, you should always use it. It's never worse. You can always make the gain of the current zero, and then you can make it equal to voltage mode control. But there are so many advantages with current mode control that um, this is this is the way to control your power conversion. And I don't care if you're using peak current mode control, where you're looking to ramp peak, whether you're using average current mode control, or you're just grabbing a little bit of current. It's all current mode control. It's all good for your system. And if you go and look at some of our past webinars, you will be able to find the description of the um, why you use current mode versus voltage mode. Current mode design process. We're going to embed this in with the secrets of current mode. And of course, we're going to be actually designing a converter at the same at the same time. So the first thing you do is an overview of where we're going to go is to build the power stage, of course. Then you measure the power stage without current mode control. And that's to verify your component values, your L's and your C's, your ESRs, and the proper operation of your converter. So measuring the power stage without the current mode enabled is just a health check of your system. Everything is switching properly. There's no strange events going on. If you can't get clean waveforms in voltage mode, then you've got to work on that before you proceed to closing the current loop. Next thing to do is to look at the current waveforms on the scope. So you need a current sensor and you've got to keep them clean. And we'll talk a little bit later about exactly what that means for your converts. Then you close the current loop and you measure the new power stage with that current loop closed. And this is a term that Middlebrook came up with in the 1980s of closing the current loop and then recharacterizing the power stage with the current loop closed. And different researchers around the world looked at it in different ways, but th this is the way that has evolved for designing current mode. Then you want to design and implement the compensating wrap. And that, that gives people a lot of heartache. A lot, of, a, lot, a lot of headaches on the board in, in exactly how to do that compensating ramp. And the reason people get confused is because the methods that are recommended in, the, in a lot of the textbooks, the app notes, uh, design guides, don't work very well, and you shouldn't use them. You're going to use the compensating ramp to control the double poles at half the switching frequency. So you've got to verify that they're doing their job. And that, of course, starts out as a theoretical process when you're first choosing your, your compensating ramp, but it ends up often as, a, as a, an empirical process because it doesn't always work exactly the way you want it to. Then you do the compensator of the system, and then you measure the outer loop gain of the system, and of course move on to full characterization of output impedance, audio susceptibility, PSRR, and looking at the loops over every different line load temperature condition that you can think of. So that is our design process that we work in. And of course, while, um, while I'm talking here, feel free to send in questions. We will stop and address questions. 
on the way. Uh, somebody is putting a question, by the way, the fourth PDF is not opening. That's because it's not a PDF. You have to get rid of the PDF, the .PDF on the Ridley Works demo, turn it into an Excel file. We're not allowed to upload Excel files to uh, go to webinars, so make sure you knock off that last part. You don't need that during this webinar, but it's there for you afterwards to go get equations and things and watch the design process. Okay, let's have a quick tour. I'm gonna to pull down the camera here. Give myself a second camera. I'm gonna give you a quick tour of the hardware that we're gonna work with today. So we've got a power supply on the bench, obviously our bulk power supply, and we've got our test board right here with a control board on it, input caps. This is the power switches and the transformer. This is one of the transformers that gets wound in our design labs. The output cap and diode, and then the output bulk capacitors on here. And then, of course, we've got a load bank on here for loading down the power supply. And then we've got a Ridley box, which is going to do all the testing. And, of course, this Ridley box is running the presentation and webinar today um, going out live to you. So that's our, that's our hardware. Put my camera back up here. Okay. And the first thing we're going to do after we built our power stage is measure just the power stage. So right now we'll have a controller on the power stage that looks like this. It's a really slow controller, four microfarad compensating cap here, and 150k, 100k divider. So this is a really slow loop of about one, one, um, one hertz crossover. And then we're going to inject a signal into the controller to see how it works. So now let's look at our oops. All right, my keyboard is not working. There we go, keyboard. Let's go to our design program now. So here's the schematic of our converter. It's a flyback with a flyback transformer here. Characteristics of the transformer, it's got a 64 micro Henry turns ratio. It's about a two to one turns ratio. And output diode, output cap. The output cap is about uh, 400 microfarads with a four milliohm ESR on it. So step one on this converter is to measure the control to output gain of the converter with voltage mode control on it. So let's jump into our Ridley box software right here. Let's clear the old stuff. Let's connect. Ridley box connected. Okay, this is our the world's first talking frequency response analyzer and scope. And let's click on the plant because that's what we want to measure, just the power stage and click sweep. Sweep initiated. So we're beginning the sweep of our power stage now. So this is sweeping the power stage with the current loop open. Here we can see our measurement coming in, in purple. And while that's coming in, it takes a little while because now we're measuring a frequency response analysis in the, in, the, in the presence of a large amount of noise. So we cut down the bandwidth on the measurement and we go slow to make sure we collect plenty of data. While that's coming in, we can actually jump back into our design program. You are using voltage mode control. And we can compare. And here we see the power stage prediction in blue on this curve. And then we can see the purple measurement coming in right on top of that. So it's finished. That's sweep number 168 out of 200. There's the switching frequency noise coming in. 100 kilohertz, we ignore that. And what we've done now is a health check of our system. Does this measurement agree with what we thought that LC filter should be. So we can see the DC gain is correct, the resonant frequency is correct, the capacitor value and the ESR value is correct. The only thing we're missing, and I talked about this in previous webinars, is that the Q of the filter here, we always miss that. Filters are always more damped 
than the theory tells you that they are. So we miss, miss a bit of Q here, but we really don't care too much because we're going to close a current loop around the system is the next thing we're going to do. Okay, so that's our measurement of the control to output. Right, now we're going to go back. What was our next step? We're going to measure the power stage without current mode. So we've just verified our filter. We've made sure everything's working. We've got a nice, healthy power stage. Now we want to look at the current sense on a scope. So we go to our frequency response analyzer. We disable that for now. And then we turn on the scope. Okay, what have we got here is a four channel scope. Don't need any feedback. And we'll hook up to the current sense waveform. And there we go. This is the current sense waveform that we're getting. Now, any of you with some experience will say, yep, don't believe it. It's, it's never that clean. And of course you're right. So let's do this. Let's turn off the filtering. There's the current waveform that we're seeing for this circuit. And let's change the time base a little bit here. Go to smaller time base. And let's freeze that. Oh, we've got a good waveform in the middle. There you go. So this is what I would call a good current waveform. We've got the turn on spike here and ringing. Obviously some work needs to be done to clean up the ringing a little bit. We've got to turn off waveform and some ringing there. I would like to see those cleaned up a little bit. In between this early turn on phase here and the end, we've got a really nice linear ramp coming along. Here you can see a little peak in the current sensing. That's where you're driving the gate hard, suddenly pulling the gate down, and that, that affects the current sensing. But this is the ramp signal that we're going to use. You turn that on again, trigger a little better. There, so there we're triggering on the waveform. And of course, when you look at app notes these days, everything looks clean because everybody's got a fancy scope where you can filter the waveforms. There you go. Now everything looks like the textbook. Um, this is a good thing and a bad thing. It, it, it makes it easy to explain how, how these circuits work, but um, it, it's hiding what's really going on. Because sometimes when you're looking at these waveforms, let's turn that filtering off again, these spikes can actually interrupt the PWM comparator and cause problems. So you're looking at the height of these spikes. And of course, in the hardware itself, you're going to filter this, not just on the scope. So the next thing you got to do to this current waveform, once you made sure this is a nice linear looking ramp here, is to filter it properly. Let's go to the Here's our measurement of the power stage. And here's our current waveform. We just looked at this, which is in your handout. Then we filter it, either with the scope, and of course you filter it in hardware as well, going into your chip. The filtering on the scope doesn't, doesn't help the chip work. So this is your second secret of current mode control. Sense the current cleanly. And what does that mean? That means if you've got an isolated converter, higher power, you're going to use a current transformer. The current transformer does two things. One, it lets you dissipate almost zero energy in the current sensing. And two, it lets you cleanly reestablish ground points in the converter. So you can ground the sense leads of the current transformer right next to the control chip. And that stops the current sensing signal flowing through all your ground points. If you've got a lower power converter, the current sensing is done usually with a resistor relative to ground. And that's okay too, as long as you keep your controller really close and you generate a decent sized signal. As power levels go up and you can't afford a big drop across the current sense resistor, you get smaller and smaller signals in the presence of more and more noise. That's why we use the current transformer. Here you can see this signal, we're generating about a one, one volt signal on the current sense. 
And if you're just a low power person, you'll say, wow, that's a lot of signal. You know, I'm used to a tenth of a volt or 50 millivolts. Well, as the power levels go up, you can't work with that kind of small signal anymore. You've got to make this big. And then that's where the current transformer comes in. Now we want to close that loop. So here you can see we're closing the current on the power stage. We're just grabbing a piece of the current with that current transformer. Lots of different ways to do this. And we're feeding it into the comparator. All right, there we go. So now we want to go measure the power stage. Let's jump out of here. Let's get out of our scope. And I've got to turn down the power for a minute. Take my control board right here. Here we've got a control board where we plug in all the parts. Oops. So let's see my video. And we're going to move a jumper to go from current mode, voltage mode, which was before, to current mode. If you've got the right chip, you can do this. If you've got the wrong chip, you can't do this. So whether or not you're able to do that first voltage mode measurement will depend on which control chip that you chose. This is always hard getting the jumpers in. Okay. Current mode. We've changed it. Voltage mode to current mode. Plug the control board back in. Hook up the injection. And let's bring on the power stage again. Okay, go back to our measurement. So here we had the first measurement, which was voltage mode. Let's save that. Voltage mode. That was our health check of the system. Let's connect to the analyzer again. And let's do another sweep. Brightly box connected. Sweep initiated. Okay, now we're sweeping again. Uh, let me look. Right, somebody asked about the injection of the control, and if you look at our handouts, you'll see how we how we do that. And we're using the uh, 3825 control chip here. It's the most versatile chip on the market, outside of the digital ones that are coming along, where you can do a lot of the stuff digitally as well. And why am I getting 40 dB? Because I'm measuring the wrong signal. I had my pro hooked up to the current. I don't want it on the current. Clear that. Stop. Sweep cancelled. And sweep again. Sweep initiated. So, yeah, 3825 control chip here. It's an expensive chip for a low power work, but a lot of people actually do still use this chip. Um, aerospace, very popular. It's, a, it's an older bipolar chip. It's rugged. You've got every control, every data point to it. You can do worst case analysis on it. So it endures, you know, way beyond where I think the chip companies wanted it to. All right. So we're slowly sweeping along here. You can see our sweep coming in as compared to the red of voltage mode before. So there we go. You see that coming in. And we see how the, the power stage has now changed. This is the big point of making these two measurements. How does this characteristic, this double pole characteristic, change to current mode control? And so far you can see, hey, it looks like a nice single pole response right there. When you read your textbooks and your app notes, you will see that nice single pole response. And then depending on which app note or paper you're reading, you will see more stuff going on out here. So this is one half the switching frequency. Let me move my cursor along there. And we see at that point the classic characteristics of another double pole coming in. So we had a two pole system for voltage mode. One of those poles has gone back here to form the single pole of current mode. The other pole has gone out here to merge with another pole from high frequency to cause another double pole. So this is the current mode secret number three. Your 
control to output transfer function of the second order system is three poles. One here and a complex double pole at half the switching frequency. Um, if you want to be technically correct, you keep sweeping, you see, oh, so there's another double pole going on here. What's that about? Well, that's at three halves the switching frequency. And then there'll be another one at five halves and seven halves and so on. So in reality, a current mode system has an infinite number of poles to it. Not one, not two. Three is a good approximation because I care about this one. The other ones are just, you know, higher and higher frequency harmonics that, uh, you know, some people actually learn how to use these. Listen to Hamish Lev's presentations. He talks about how to use, you know, harmonics to generate control of other things in the system. But the first thing we see here, this is a current mode system with no compensating ramp. And why would we need one? Because we're working less than 50% duty cycle, right? But you need one because this pole is getting peaky. That means when you look at the waveforms, you're going to see them jitter back and forth. And we're only running at about a 40% duty cycle now. But you have this fairly high Q double pole coming in here that needs to be taken care of. Okay. So that was our secret number three. The current mode system is a third order system for all intents and purposes. Okay. Let's save that trace. Data set two. So that's current mode, mode, no wrap. And again, almost all of the app notes will tell you you don't need a ramp for less than 50% duty cycle. Okay? And it's wrong. If you don't put the ramp in, when you first start up your converter, it's going to be really close as you bring up the voltage to, to the full 50%. And there's going to be a period in there where it just sits there and jitters and makes a noise at you. And you have to dial up the voltage further to push the duty cycle back till you get to the point where it's clean. So you're not going to be using that part of the duty cycle. That's going to affect your efficiency. It's going to affect your converter operation. You know, it's not a good thing to not kill this uh, wrap, to not kill this double polling. Okay, so forget what you think you know about that. You've got to add the ramp, even if you're less than 50% duty cycle. So I'm going to dial down my input voltage. And I'm going to pull out my control board here. And I'm going to put my ramp in. And I'll tell you in a minute how we're doing that. It's a little bit different to what you're probably doing. So now we just add a resistor on the board. We've got a ramp. It's actually a resistor, a diode, and a cap. It's all you need to add a ramp. Why wouldn't you do it? Well, I don't know. Always add the ramp. Or differently, I would say always put the, revision, the, 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 the possibility on your board of your real product for the ramp to be there. If you decide not to populate it later because you think you don't need it, that's fine. You can do that. But you really don't want to reinvent a ramp after you've laid the entire board out when you thought you didn't need a ramp. Let's go ahead. We've added the ramp. Bring up the input power supply again to low line up there. And then let's re-sweep that loop. Sweep initiated. OK, so we're going through another sweep. And you can see at low frequencies, the gain has dropped a little bit. Somebody's asked, what's the justification for the ramp compensation at second pole frequency? Um, go read my dissertation. Uh, go read any of the app notes. They all talk about how you get jitter at half the switching frequency without a ramp. Okay, but what it is in the small signal world, control world, it's changing the Q of this ramp here, of this double pole right there. So I have to go do a little bit of uh, homework on that. that. So we've added a ramp. It's still a single pole system. The gain has changed a little bit down here, about 6 dB. The pole has shifted a little bit. This region here, it stayed the same. And then out at half the switching frequency, you see we've taken away the peaking of the double pole. And of course, we've taken away the peaking of the next double pole too. Let's save that data set three. Current mode with ramp. Oops. 
Okay, so we went from voltage mode, two pole system, current mode, a three pole system where the second and third poles were very evident, to current mode with a ramp where we've now pushed down the peak of this double pole at half the switching frequency. How much do we push it down? Well, that's where you know you're going to run through your theory, you're going to read through a whole bunch of control books, and the Unitro TI books will say, well, use half the downslope of the current. Another one will say, use the full downslope of the current. Somebody else will say, we'll use this value here. We use a value for a Q of one when we design. Everybody uses about the same value. It's not critical. What almost always happens in everybody's power supply who's doing current mode for the first time, they have to keep cranking up the ramp to make it work properly because they don't have a clean enough current waveform. So you either end up with more ramp that you need, which means you're going to overdamp these poles, or you have to go and revise the way that you're current sensing. Um, and you know that that's getting more and more difficult these days with these very high frequency converters. Deciding how to sense the current cleanly is a problem because you can no longer put it inside the loop of the switch synchronous rectifier capacitor. You can't put a current transformer in there. It just won't fit without changing that circuit drastically. So you have to come up with other ways of sensing the current, which we do with observers. And that's a topic that I talked about a little bit in the last uh, webinar, and we'll come back to that because it's an important topic. Let's go look at the ramp. So we've measured the new power stage, added the ramp, damped it out. You add the ramp even below 50% duty cycle. Okay. Here's the ramp. I'm going to go look at that live in a minute. Okay. The next secret is in current mode, don't use the clock ramp, even though most of the app notes tell you to do it. Here's a typical app note pulled from, I think, uh, Unitrode a long time ago, TI, whoever where you have a control clock cap here, and they say, well, just tie that clock signal to your current sense signal through a big resistor. Okay. It's a sensitive signal here, it's a small cap. Okay, when you do that, you're loading it, and you can't drag much current out of it. So another app note says, well, do this, hook it up to a transistor, and then you can load it with about a 10K resistor. My philosophy of design, and a lot of people come to the same conclusion, is just don't touch the clock right here. Don't hang any traces on it. Don't even put a probe on it. Some of you have been through this, I'm sure, where you take your scope probe, you say, well, my converter's not working properly. Let me go look at the clock, make sure it's clean. And you touch the clock and bang, your converter blows up. Okay, This is a very, very sensitive pin. So don't use it. Don't do it that way. Don't do it that way. I think in the notes here, I haven't put the um, method I use, but it's inside our software. You can go look inside the demo software as well. So, okay, go click on ramp here. And let's make it current mode now. Go to current mode control. Okay. And let's see how we did on those measurements, by the way. You are using current mode control. Okay, here was our current mode, and you can see that we miss. The measurement and the prediction aren't quite together. And that's because we left in a ramp for voltage mode from before. So get rid of that, delete that. Okay. Go you are using the... current mode control. Oh. Didn't do so much better on that one. Let's have a look at that again. Oh, some, something something strange went on there. You are using but you see how we've got the characteristics coming in, you know, the same shape, damping over here. Obviously, I've got to tweak a value in there. I'm not sure what that is. It's prob probably the value of the current sensing. I don't know. The input voltage. Input voltage, is it? You are using current mode control. Mm, no, it looks the same. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You can see, so we would work harder on getting that measurement and prediction 
together with each other to make those a great. Okay. And what the reason I came in here was to show you the ramp edition. This is how I add a ramp. Remember, my rule is don't touch the clock. You take the gate drive output and you use it to charge up an RC network. And then when the gate drive goes low, you discharge it through a Schottky diode. So here we've got a 10 nanofarad or 100 nanofarad cap. It's a pretty big cap compared to the clock cap. And it's got a little signal on it, maybe a volt or less, that you just then you can mix that in with the current signal and you're not messing around with the clock at all. I can't emphasize how important it is to get this ramp circuit right. And it's tempting not to do this because it's, uh, you know, I could just hang a, hang a big resistor on the clock and it'll be all right. I'm not sure I'm going to need it anyway. Trust me, don't do that. Okay. All kinds of bad things can happen. All right. So that's how we're adding our ramp to the circuit. All right, where are we now? We are on, we've just measured the ramp in there. You are using current mode control. I do, would like to know why I'm not quite agreeing with my prediction of measurements, because they're usually right on top of each other. Uh, power is good, voltage is good, this is good. I'm sure it's the current sensing gain. Ah, uh, that would be it. I believe there's a 10 ohm in there. Update. You are using current mode control. There you go. There you go. That's about as good as it ever gets in the real world. Now you can see predictions and measurements falling right on top of each other. So how are we designing how much current feedback we have? You know, are we doing a complicated analysis, well, I want to put the gain on the current this, gain on the voltage to be that, and do this, and integrate, and so on. No, it's, it's it's not that complicated. You just look at your current signal, and this cleaned up signal after the filter has to be less than the headroom of your comparator. That's all you do. You scale the current up to fit this waveform underneath the comparator headroom. And that's the design of the feedback of the current loop. So we're not talking small signal or anything like that. We're just scaling the signal to make sure we're using the full dynamic range that we have. And it's an interesting uh, effect in current mode is that actually you don't have control over the gain of the current by scaling that signal up and down. Regardless of how big you make that signal, the current loop stays the same, which is an odd thing. So you'd have to go do some reading to convince yourself of that. And, and that strange thing happens is if I, if I make this current mode signal twice as big, the ramp gets twice as big, the modulator gain gets twice as small. So nothing you can do changes the gain of the current loop. You just make the signal big enough to fit underneath the headroom of the comparator. Okay, where am I? So we've measured the new power stage. You've added the ramp, and let's go look at it, just because that is part of our design process. So we'll turn off the ramp analyzer. Box disconnected. We'll turn on the scope. And Oops. Turn that off. Oh, correct. Signal. So there's my current signal. I don't know why that got bigger all of a sudden, but it did. There's my current signal coming on. Oh, this is the current plus the ramp in the into the controller, and the ramp is a decent part of that slope. Okay, so when you're looking at the ramp signal, it should be a significant part of the overall slope. So this is a couple of tenths of a volt for about a 30% duty cycle right now. And this is about four tenths of a volt. Okay, oops, should have a bit better. Okay, right there. Okay, so the ramp slope and the current sense slope are in the same ballpark. You shouldn't have one much bigger than the other. If you 
don't, don't have enough current slope, you're going to see jitter. Notice that we were getting peaking in that control to output of the current transfer function, even though we were less, well less than 50% duty cycle. Let's go down a bit on the input voltage. Okay, so now our duty cycle is increasing. Uh, let's do that a little expertly. And you can see it's smooth. It first starts regulating. It's pretty smooth on there. Let's uh, trigger on the down slope. Okay. So there's the 50% duty cycle. All is good. Let me go ahead and pull the ramp out a bit again. I'll do that while the circuit's running. Don't recommend that. And now we see the ramp is not in there. And we dial down the voltage again. Let's trigger. Now you see right there, you see this jumping around. Okay. That's the subharmonic oscillation. We've lost control of the converter there. So it's just jittering back and forth because we haven't added the ramp to it. And again, we're well less than 50% duty cycle here. Okay, so if you're going to believe the app notes, they tell you this is okay. They say everything's fine, everything's stable. No, it's not. It's jittering. And when you close the next loop, it will get much worse. Okay, so you don't want to see this going on in your converter. Okay. I'm not going to plug that one back in, but I think you I think you get the point there. This is high frequency jitter at 50 kilohertz, but it's random. So it kicks up stochastic noise, and that's when you hear your converter. Some of you, I'm sure, have heard this. Your converter comes in, just starts to regulate, and it kind of makes a hissy noise at you. Okay? It means you don't have enough ramp or something unclean is going on in the modulator. So make sure you take care of this. Damp out that tendency to oscillate. Okay, what are we going to do next? Uh, let's go back to here. So we've done that. We figured out the proper way to add the clock ramp. Now let's go into our design program and say, okay, here's my measurement. Here's my prediction right on top of each other. Everything is good. Now let's go ahead and do design of the compensator. So turn on compensation right here so now you see the green curve Turn it by itself if you like so here's the compensator so integral and then a lead and then a lag or it's a type 2 compensator that we're putting into the system has uh lots of gain down here uh you see the, the it, it's a compensator that does not uh, raise the phase above zero degrees it pulls it up towards zero but it never gets there because it's just a type two there's no differentiation so the pole comes in and it knocks the phase back down again what are we trying to achieve with our compensator we're trying to get ourselves a nice loop gain on the system so this is our loop gain so down here we've got about 70 db of gain it's down with the minus one slope then it hits the pole of the power stage down with the minus two slope for a while zero of the compensator kicks in we go back to a minus one slope and then a half the switching frequency the double poles break in so here it goes down from a minus one to a minus three slope okay, so another pole coming in from the compensator of the system so this is my loop gain it's crossing over right now at five kilohertz 65 degrees uh remember from a previous webinar Use this form to you know don't, don't obsess over equations look at these curves do i like that loop do i like that phase margin well if i don't well drop down the zero a little bit okay so this is going down to a lower frequency and now the phase margin is climbing maybe you want 72 degrees of phase in here you can get that if you if you tweak this down from where it wants it to be and of course there's trade-offs in doing that you're working with curves. It's not complex mathematical matrix analysis. You're looking at the curves, you're shaping them, looking at the phase margin, deciding whether you like what you see here. So learn to read these curves. It's an important skill for engineers. Okay? Don't obsess over equations on this. And there's our compensator. What we do now is we, we've chosen the pole zeros. We've got the shape that we like. Now you click on this compensation button 
And here you can see the values that need to be plugged into the board. Okay, so we've got an open loop board right now. And what I'm gonna do is power this down. I'm gonna take my control board with its slow open loop values. And don't worry, I'm not gonna do what I did last time, which was to plug in the values while you watch. Okay, so here's, here's my, so my board is here. I'm gonna hand this over to John, my trusty assistant. Plug in the values for me. You can see my other screen here while he's doing that. So while he's plugging values into that board, should take him a couple of minutes. <laughs> Let's see what questions we've got here. Uh, let's see. I see John has answered many of your questions. So I appreciate that. John Beecroft is helping out here. Do we have a webinar on read how to read curves? Well, that's what engineering is all about. Um, engineering these days with, uh, with the new graduates and the way things are done in university is not about how to read curves. It's how to crank, crank equations. Okay, you've lost the plot, I'm afraid. It's not about that. Here's, here's, an, anal here's an analogy for you. Analogies are not, are not, not very good, but you know, if, you, if you wanna build a car and you wanna put a tire on it, you're not gonna go look up the uh, chemical composition of the tire and uh, you know, deep, deep analysis of how you actually make a tire. You just buy a tire and you put it on, okay? Curves, you know, you're not gonna look for a transistor equation and say, well, what's the transistor equation so I can optimize switching? It's like, no, you get the curve of the transistor and you draw your lines on the curve and you say, okay, I want one that switches a bit faster. Well, give me a different curve on that. Okay, control is the same thing. Don't get obsessed with diving deep, deep, deep into equations. You know, work with the curves. It's the way we've always done it in this field. It's the way that Bode did it. It's the way Nyquist did it. They did diagrams and curves. Learn how to read them, study them. Okay, that is not a dead art. That is the way that we do it because the equations almost always fall apart in power systems. There's so much noise, there's such a complex system, it's so high order that you, you have to move away and say, okay, let me just go measure that. And that's what the whole body, body, body plot world is all about. Okay, get one more question. Is it okay to record this webinar for yourself? Well, you can if you want to, we'll have a cleaner, cleaner version. I see that was already answered, sorry. How would you calculate R and C value? Well, when we wrote this program 30 years ago, that's the first question I answered. How do you calculate the R's and C's of a compensator for a type one, type two, type three? It's, it's, it's a 40, 50 year old question. So you can go recrank the equations yourself. You can go read Basso's book if you want to do that. You can get our you know, free demo software. Here's the equations for the compensator. It will solve them for you. Okay, you you, re you really don't need to go back and do this by hand yourself. Okay, let's see where John's flight here. I see my board has just come back, John, so that's good. Constant on time, which can't use Bode analysis. Why not? Constant on time is fine with Bode analysis. If you go read my dissertation, there's a chapter in the dissertation on constant on time, constant off time. These controllers have been around forever. In fact, some of the first current mode controllers were actually constant on time and constant off time. And they sure did a body plot for that. So there's nothing special about constant frequency. So when you're doing constant on time, it's like a, it's like any, any non-linear system. You put the set point in and you're at constant frequency. You just perturb it and it doesn't care whether it's constant on time, constant off time. There's a small shift in the gain of the modulators and not much else but it's absolutely works variable frequency control, constant on time, constant off time, any any kind of control you get, you can come up with, um, with a body plot. If you're doing some of the digital stuff that goes on, some of the bang bang controls, for example. So power integrations has a bunch of parts where they slam the switch full on, and then they stop and then slam it on and then they stop. You can't, you can't linearize that. So no body plot for that one, but uh, you know, that, that's fairly low power where that's being done. So is that on digital there? Digital. Uh, how will things change in a digital current mode control? They, they are absolutely knocking themselves out, trying to figure out how to sense a ramp and compare it to a reference, just like analog does, okay? In fact, in a lot of the digital controllers, they give up 
because that's hard to do digitally. Watch that current instantaneously and trip. You can't do that digitally. You can't sample enough and it's too noisy. So some of the digital controllers like the TI, Piccolo and some others, they just put comparators back in the controllers for you. They say, all right, let's do that bit analog. We want the fast protection, the fast current mode. That's one solution. There are cleaner solutions I'd like to be explored, but uh, I don't know anyone that's doing that. All right, we now have a closed loop board come here. All the values from our inverter I put in there. I didn't change anything. They don't have it. Right, so there's our board, it's all ready to go. Plug them in. So what we've got is we plugged in one, two, three, four, five, six values. I know, don't yep. worry. And a ramp value. Okay, so here's the values that you use. And of course, these are you know values you're not going to find. So 22.7 became a 22k, 16.7 that became a 16.2 or whatever the nearest value is. Okay, you can fill the actual values in if you want to, or you can um, you know find precision resistors only two resistors matter r1 rb they have to be good resistors maybe one percent maybe 0.1 percent depending on what your dc regulation is going to be the other ones here 20 percent plus or minus is fine okay you just shift in the curve a little bit not rocket science it's not precision you can shift it 20 percent and everything will be stable that's what phase margin is all about you put plenty in there, so you're going to allow for shift in these components. And of course, you're not going to hit capacitor values right on the nose, you know, because they've just got discrete jumps in those. All right, let's go turn off our scope. Don't need that anymore. Go back to the analyzer, turn it back on. And we've got to move our probe. Go to the presentation for a minute. There's our compensator values. We now move, before we had a probe channel C of this analyzer, four channel analyzer was going on the output of the air amplifier, and channel D was going to the output of the power supply. So make that bigger. So I was going from channel C to channel D. Now I'm going from channel D to channel A. Actually, my probes are already there because I've got it's the advantage of the four channel analyzer. So now we're going to go and try and measure the loop of this system. Go back, jump into the ready box, turn it on, and tell it that we want to measure a loop gain now. Notice here we've got these menus. Before we measured the plant, now we measure the loop Use gain. This Ridley box set up for measuring loop gains. Shows you your test setup. Okay. You can go look at the settings. What it's done now is it's changed the source to a variable amplitude, and it's got initial value, final value, and different poles coming in. And if you want to get sophisticated, you can go actually look at that source coming in here, and then you can change the source settings. So you can dial numbers up and down, so we can make that number bigger. We can push it all around visually. Doing it all with the curves again. What's the equation? I don't know, I don't remember that. If you don't like that and you want your own equations for injecting, you know, we give you a source size here where you can come in and manually change that in an Excel sheet. Okay. That's the great thing about our software. You all know Excel. Everything is there. Everything is looking at you. All right. Let's see if we can measure a loop on this system. Let's turn on the power supply first. So that'll help. And there we go. And click on sweep. Sweep initiated. Now we've got a challenge in measurements on our hand because we're supposed to be somewhere up above 60, 70 dB on this loop gain. And I'm measuring zero dB. Let's make sure I got the right po probes. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, I'm not injecting a signal. Let's inject a signal. Before, when I was injecting into the power stage only, I was using that little impedance network to inject the signal. Now I'm doing the classic loop injection technique uh, right here, where I'm going from the source through an isolation transformer across this 20 ohm resistor here. Okay. And with the Ridley box analyzer, the isolator is built in. So that's all, it's just a connector on the box, which is nice. You don't have another chunk of test equipment on your bench. 
So let's go back here. Okay. And you can see we lost the initial part of that because I didn't have a signal injection, but it's moving along quite happily now. And let's go compare with the prediction. And really works. You are using current mode control. And of course, some of you have your own MathCAD files and things, you know, for doing this. You know, that, that box just, it flows data straight into Excel. So this data is reading right into a column of Excel. And it does it live, which is kind of cool. You don't have to stop and then export values. It's all there live. So then you can just plot that on top of whatever kind of models you like to use. You can probably flow it into MathCAD, MATLAB, whatever you want to do, as long as you know how to grab some cells from Excel. Back to Ridleyworks. And here we see our prediction. Turn off the compensator. I don't see the measurement yet. Let's turn on the measurement. There's the measurement. Look at that right on top of the predicted loop gain here. That's pretty good. See the phase is not on top, it's 180 degrees out of phase. So flip it. So there you go. So there you see our phase and our gain doing a nice job of laying right on top of each other. Okay. It's going a bit slow now, you'll notice that. Okay, that's because we've set our bandwidth lower. Because the bandwidth of the measurement is 10 hertz. Okay, before when we were measuring the power stage, it was 100 hertz. And the reason that we refine this down more is that we're trying to measure these high loop gains. We've got to make sure our op amps are working properly. We're getting the gain that we want. We want to see that these low frequency region with line noise is truly getting the gain that we want in there. Okay, so you have the option to drop this down to one hertz if you want to. If you wanted to do 0 0.1 hertz, you could do that too. Okay, so there's our measurement flowing in. And, you know, if you're used to using our AP analyzer, you know, this is a bit, bit slow compared to that. But quite honestly, when you're plotting it on top of prediction, you got a lot of thinking to do. It's like, hmm, what happened here? I dropped a little bit of phase there. This looks good. This looks good. You know, let's go see what happens over here. So everything is tracking along really well. But now the high frequency part, you can see that the phase is actually rolling off earlier than predicted. Normally to me, that means that my op amp can't handle it, okay? So our op amp, well, it's not asking for much gain here, you know, just 6 dB of gain, but the phase is starting to roll off a little bit early. So that, that would be the only difference here. When you're in the lab measuring your power stages, you know, if you get them this close, you're doing a really, really good job. And you have to decide, do I want to try and model this? Do I want to sit, you know, on my computer for days or weeks or months trying to get this better? And then after a while you say, you know what, this is about as good as it's ever going to get. When I cross over, the model is really good. A little bit beyond that, up to one tenth of switching frequency, it's really good. Don't worry about these deviations further on. Okay, let's go, where are we now? By the way, I really like this thing where the data flows as it goes. You know, whether you're using a simulator or a measurement device, if it goes and measures and then just throws all the data at you, you're overwhelmed. It's like, well, what am I looking at? But when it comes into you, you know, at a controlled pace here, it's like, oh, I can think about that bit. Oh, I can think about this bit. Then I can think about crossover. Then I can think about here. Let's go start that beginning part again, where the high gain is. We have an auto sweep here that repeats. Um, quite honestly, I sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't. And now you see we're getting almost 70 dB of gain here in this region. Now it's a little bit more noisy down here because when this is 70 dB, well, if it was 60 dB, that's a gain of a thousand. The injected signal is probably a couple of hundred millivolts. That means the other measured signal is a couple of hundred microvolts. So the fact that you can do this, you know, with, with actually scope waveforms is pretty amazing. And it, it's all a function of how well you ground, how cleanly you do it, what the software settings are, and so on. Okay, so there you go. We filled in that part of the loop right there. And um, let's just... Done that bit. And 
don't worry about that. Let's do one more experiment here. Let's measure this loop without the ramp in it. I haven't done this experiment, so this will be interesting. Let's go back to measure. Pull out my ramp while it's running. Dangerous, don't do that. Got practice. <laughs> so let's sweep that. Let's crank up the bandwidth a little bit to 100 hertz so it goes a bit faster. We don't have to wait. Then we'll sweep one more time. Sweep initiated. So you can see this family of curves you're collecting here, which is nice. So you've got the original voltage mode power stage in red, which is labeled. Then you did the current mode with no ramp. Then you did the current mode with a ramp. And then you did, let me save this data set for actually. Loop. We saved a little bit of the new sweep there, but don't worry about that. So that green curve is the loop with the ramp. See the gain has gone up there. We'd expect it to because the yellow to blue curve was the removal of the ramp. So that gain went up. So now we're going to come on down here. And when you're doing these sweeps, you know, people have asked me recently about dynamic ranges of these machines. Um, it's a very deceptive thing. What you really care about is what's your dynamic range with a lot of noise in the system. That tells you, are you able to measure these kind of gains in the system, which are important to you? Or can you not see them because the noise overwhelms you know, the system? So here we go, sweeping along here. And you see the phase now is pulling up. Well, that's nice, we gained a bit of phase there. But our, our gain curve has bumped. Sweep complete. I'm going to press her out of the way a little bit. Okay. So the, the green curve there was the loop before. This is the loop now. And you can see we're getting pretty close to cutting into 10 dB of gain margin, which is my, my standard for a good loop. But even, even though there is just about enough gain margin in there, this is going to jitter. So when you bring on the power supply, it's going to sit there, wobble back and forth. Okay. When we're down, this is about a 35% unit cycle. When we're down at 45% unit cycle, this is going to get very close to zero dB. That's why you must add this ramp to, to suppress these double poles in here. Okay. I think you get the point on that. Let's go back here. Three minutes to go. We did it. We designed the converter and plugged in the parts and made all these measurements. And I talked a lot in one hour. I hope you all got a lot out of that. A couple of slides to go. Secret number six. Use the right model for current mode. If you're some of you just getting into current mode control and you're reading and getting confused, I don't blame you. Okay. But the fact is, nothing has happened since on current mode in analysis since 1990 that's worth talking about. I did work based upon our Brown's work, which was excellent. When I finished my work, Volperian came along, did a little current mode switch model, which was amazingly clever, the way that he did that. His, you can't see the current loop. Mine, you can. Take a pick. Okay. So nothing has happened since then. But that, of course, that hasn't stopped people writing papers about current mode. Most of it um, seems to be intended to confuse you. Much of it is not correct. They use the wrong gains in the system and come up with some bad conclusions in there. It will confuse you. Um, here's a free book. If you like current mode, you see the questions coming in about ramps and things, go read this book, 200 pages, the gory details of current mode control. And of course, that has references. You can go read those too. But don't agonize over it. Current mode is done. Just do it. Get on with it. Don't, you know, if you find yourself, oh, I've got to write a dissertation about current mode control, you know, don't, don't, don't do it. There's other things to be done. We don't need the refinements, quite honestly. It's been there for 30 years now. Secret number seven. So here's new secret number six. Don't wrap yourself around the axle on analysis. Secret number seven, make measurements. If you're not doing these measurements, current mode is difficult and it will go wrong. When you're measuring these systems, in making these body plot measurements and reading the curves, it's easy. We've done it in one hour here, plus a lot more. And it should be that easy when you're at work. But if you're not measuring body plots, it's not going to be that way. You'll get wrapped around on um, 
wrapped around the axle on the details of analysis can it can get very very hairy you know just just don't overanalyze this thing okay we'll answer questions in just a moment just remember you've got a demo of Ridley Works that you can download so you go download that PDF file of Ridley Works demo open it up it only does the buck conversion we want you of course to buy the full version um, for design workshops of course we're on hold with these we have all kinds of plans coming along for doing things about that um, keep an eye open on our website and of course we'll send you newsletters about what's going on with our workshop this is where you come in and you actually build the magnetics the controllers the boards yourself and it's a very intense four-day hands-on workshop that we that we do frequency response analyzers the ridley box is a good workhorse if you're aerospace high end you need the power the calibration the mill certification everything else the ap is the gold standard for all analyzers of course it's got a nice high power source on it and extended range and so on um, facebook group lots of you are on there 4,000 power supply designers on facebook it's a free book and power supply design center articles much of the things we're doing are here also here are all of our webinars from the past have I listed those no i haven't listed those go to this section here you'll find our recent webinars that you can download and look at okay and then of course there's the ridley box here it's um it's a nice tool nice tool we started shipping this week we had first ship i know i told people i was shipping last time we did a webinar but we had a few mechanical Pickups on there. All is good now. Let's see, have you flagged any things for me, John? Okay. How can we do current mode control for a bi directional interleave buck converter in which there are two inductors and four switches? Yep, good luck. That's a tough thing to do, but if it's buck converters these days, the secret to current mode is observers. You should be building observers. You shouldn't be trying to look at that switch current. So you're not looking at the drop on a resistor. You're not looking at the drop across the power switch and trying to call that a piece of current signal. It's not. You're looking at voltages and integrating them to make observers. So you've got low frequency current feedback for current sharing. You get high frequency current feedback, which you do with observers. But yeah, they, you, you've got a tough system there. Two inductors, four switches, and the pulses are doing different things. Yeah, lots of work to do. And scrolling down your questions here. Somebody said, when will be the EMI filter design for the design converters? Um, coming up in a few weeks, we're gonna deal with the control of the input EMI filter. I'm not going to do EMI design for you because first of all it's it's not a it's not a fun topic to listen to or to present and it's very empirical. The way EMI filters are done is you build your power stage, you measure the noise, you design a filter to suppress the noise. There is no theoretical predicting of the noise. Everybody has been trying to do this for decades now but they always miss. There'll be a band of noise. Oops, didn't see that one coming. And you just have to generate the converter, measure what you got, design your EMI filter around. What I find a lot more interesting than that EMI filter design, which of course we all have to do, is um, how do you control an EMI filter? People have talked about that for many, many years now. But um, the control of the converter is a, is a fairly new topic, but some of the digital people, you know, advanced digital, the high power, have certainly worked on controlling the filters outside the power supply box. So that is a webinar coming up that I was going to do at APEC that will be coming up. So for any arbitrary converter, do we do we just start Bode plots while throwing the equations out of the window? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, no, of course not. You're going to measure a Bode plot you're going to try and predict it but you got this balance you know my measurements don't agree with my prediction so why even compare well you compare because you want the predictions and measurement to show you that it's kind of working where you expected it to but almost every converter the predictions will deviate from reality if they didn't nobody would measure body plots anymore 
So, you know, the linear audio field, for example, they used to measure Bode plots. They don't anymore because their predictions and measurements are really, really good. So, no, you don't throw them out the window. You know, for all the basic converters, we've got them all in our software that we certainly overlay the predictions and the measurements to make sure you're doing it properly. I'm just saying, don't neglect the measurement. What I see these days is people try to predict and predict and predict and they never measure. It's like, well, we don't have a way to measure it. It's like, okay, well, don't ship a power supply then. You know, you, if you're not making measurements, you're not responsible to your customer because your predictions will not be 100% correct. There'll be ranges where it doesn't work. So you're not throwing it out. It's just a balance between analysis and measurement. If you like the analysis, you've got time in your product development, by all means, go for it. But it's going to fall apart at some point on all of it. Recorded webinar, you will all get an email when this webinar is done and you'll go get an invitation to come to our design center and you can see all of our webinars from the past. And we will also attach the, um, we'll attach the, uh, the handouts to that as well. Oh, yeah, flag one for you. Right? Flag one for me? Yeah. Lots of questions coming in. This is about um, Volperian switch model. Could the Volperian switch model yeah. Is the question on that? There's two, on there's two Volperian switch models. One is his PWM switch, okay? And his PWM switch was the basis for my current mode model. So I took his PWM switch and I took the work that Art Brown had and then I added a block that explained why it goes unstable at half the switching frequency because his PWM switch model couldn't do that. So he is absolutely the basis for my current mode model. So you'll find it in my dissertation. We use it all the time. You know, that's how we do analysis of converters with the Volpera and PWM switch model. Now, right after I finished my PhD dissertation, Volperian looked at it and went, hmm, I could make a switch model for that. And he came up with this, it took him two days. <laughs> it took me three years, it took him two days. He came up with this switch model where he put a little capacitor on the output and he had the exact same double pole equations that I had in a very, very elegant way, you know, and it's a nice model. As I say, you've lost the current loop. He embeds the current loop into the block and says, this is the control to output. The equations for that, the math for that, the results from there are exactly the same as my current mode model. So Mike came first and he came along and said, oh, there's a switch model that will do that for you. It's a nice little, uh, you know, spice thing you can implement but you have lost the current information. So it's a toss up between which, which one of those two that you want to use. I, I like using this voltage mode model. You put it in there, you augment it with a current loop. And then when you dial down the current loop, it turns into voltage mode. With his current mode switch model, if you dial down the gain of the current, it's relative to the ramp, in some part it falls apart and he has to switch over to a different model. So when I'm using the Volperian model, I'm only using one of them and I can transition from voltage mode to current mode control. So that's a, that's a long-winded answer to uh, Dr. Volperian's thing there. And uh, his switch model was done, I think 1986 was the publication date for that. It just, just really good work. Am I injecting which software am I using? That's the Ridley Works software, you've got that, okay. Why is the gain less in high frequency? Not sure what that means. Any other questions, John? Okay, well, we've got a few minutes over here, but that's good. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's been a pleasure teaching you all again. We'll be back in about three weeks. Not sure what we're going to do next time. I might bite off the um, input filter issue, but that's a difficult one to prepare for. Uh, I'll probably do, uh, uh, it'll probably be a magnetics webinar next time, actually. And uh, I think what we might do next time is we might actually wind a magnetic during the webinar, see if we can do that. That will be a challenge, but um, that will be fun as well. Because most most of you I know have difficulty. How do I source my custom magnetics? And it's a one week, one month, three month, three month um, process. And uh, we like to do it. You know, when we're building magnetics for ourselves, it's about a ten minutes to uh, to wind magnetics, customize them, gap them, and make them work. So we'll 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 think about bringing along some of that teaching to you. And if you have any comments, you know, about what kind of topics you'd like to see, we'll be uh, happy to get those from you too. So 
let's see, do we have any other questions coming in, John, or are they pretty much good? I think it's pretty good right now. Uh, everybody's still in here. So I think I'm going to sign off here. Thank you all for coming, and we'll be back in a few weeks. Come over to our website, come join our Facebook group, and uh, we'll talk more about how supply design. Thanks. Thanks so much for everybody. Thank you. Stop. How do I stop?